You know, Einstein, Niels Bohr, Max Planck. Uh, you know, I'd love to sit with the, you know, the particular, uh, you know, the quantum physics guys. Because there really is, is the root of understanding how and why uh, the world is the way it is. And the, 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 just the, the, the joy of these studies in antimatter that are occurring. Uh, everyone you picked is a physicist, a scientist, and I often think about how spirituality and science are merging, how they're kind of coming together. I mean, what ancient civilizations thought of as, of a universe was really the Earth and the Sun and a few planets. And now with the advent of the Hubble telescope, we can see that the universe is far bigger than the ancients had ever imagined. So. Well, science and religion are merging on some ideas, and other areas are just far off. But to make matters even more complicated, the idea of parallel dimensions or parallel universes, I mean, it's just getting so vast out there. Uh, how do you map a, a multiverse? You know, I've talked to some guys. They say that, that that fifth dimension, sixth dimension, could be right here by my ear and could be a millimeter wide and a millimeter across. You don't, you know, because you're talking about, you know, dimensions that defy any kind of dimensional understanding. And, um, you know, there was a, a, I forget his name, he died recently, in the last two years, but his, he proposed that, that there, there are parallel realities just because of the way we, we go through time. Like, here we are in this interview right now. Well, what I said and what you said and what we, we all did two minutes ago still exists somewhere because it, we just did it it's there it's like a wake we've left and uh, and if you had a time vehicle you could go back to two minutes before and and stop and, and see what we we're doing two minutes before you go back to your high school days you go back to your days as an infant uh, and those realities are still existing alongside what what we're progressing through um, you know it's it's all a beautiful beautiful mystery I I'm here because I am a, a writer, a performer. I find it entertaining. I'm not a scientist. Uh, I, uh, you know, and I'm not a theosopher or philosopher. And I, I, you know, I am just here because it is enormously, enormously entertaining. And mysteries like this are challenging. And it's really, really fun to contemplate uh, that, uh, you know, they're. There may be beings out there who are concerned about our planet and who may give us the opportunity to advance ourselves. It's, it's really fun to contemplate. The, all the physics that we know on this planet, quantum physics uh, and, uh, and conventional physics and, and metallurgy and, and uh, you, know, you know, all of it, it can it can really encompass a theory of how these ships move. I mean, you've you've done it yourself, David, uh, proposing you know that when if you can convert you know a mass to a, a state of you know of photonic energy, then there is no uh, there is no mass anymore, and you're, you're looking at pure light. You're looking at anti gravity. You're looking at uh, something that can be you know uh, harnessed in waves. Well, what is the fuel? Well, people you know, Bob Lazar talked about you know this element 115 uh, that was put into uh, these generators uh, to boil mercury and uh, to be used as gravity tractors maybe maybe that's it I, I, I don't know I mean uh, they must be using a fuel that, that's unavailable to us is it, is it does it does it give off radioactive waste what is the cost to them for instance the Venice UFO that you recently showed me and and I love I covet that tape that's amazing uh, because you see the metallic quality of the object, you see the force field around it, you see it spinning. It was uh, May 2nd, uh, 2004, approximately 11.30 a.m. And uh, I was walking from my apartment with my girlfriend down this alley right here. And we were just sort of walking this way and I looked up uh, over at those phone lines and we saw something that we really couldn't make sense of. It was a uh, very shiny, you know, uh, metallic disc. So we turned the corner here, and uh, this is basically where we're just looking at it. 
and uh, we're pretty much like, uh, okay, that's uh, not a balloon or anything we're familiar with. So uh, we sort of kept walking to the corner and just uh, stared at it for a while and, until it hit me, uh, you know, that this was really something. There was a man uh, also looking at it, uh, sort of a bystander, and he said, uh, Wow, uh, do you guys see that? And that's when I realized all three of us were looking at something extraordinary. Well, what is the environmental cost of running these machines? Are they clean or are they not? Is there some, wherever you know they came from, is there some place they have to go back to after their journeys are finished to dump whatever uh, they've used up in terms of fuel like we would an, a, a bad fuel rod in a reactor? Um, that that is a, is a question I'd, I'd like to know, I'd like to ask is, you know, is you, are you a clean burning uh, vessel or is there some cost that, that you pay like we paid for atomic energy? When we consider that it may be possible to take mass and, and reduce it down to zero, make it as light as a photon, um, we can start to uh, approach this whole light speed phenomena from a whole new direction. I mean, we're going to be able to do this. This is, this is the only logical answer. There are no visible nuclear materials in the universe as we know it to produce the kind of energies in a steady stream that you need to get mass up to that speed. There are no visible nuclear fuels that can produce one trillion electron volts all day long. And, let's, and wormholes. Wormholes are even more exotic. The idea of you know, bending and folding two sp spaces of space-time together and creating a shortcut wormhole to vector in between those two points. Uh, according to Kip Thorne, who wrote uh, Black Holes and, and Time Warps, that the energy required for a wormhole is a hundred million suns, the energy, the negative energy they put out for an entire year. There are a hundred million suns in our galaxy alone. That means all of the negative solar energy coming from our suns in this whole galaxy the total energy for a whole year is required to create a wormhole. Where, is, where has any extraterrestrial civilization or our civilization going to get access to levels of energy that high? It's never going to happen. That's why I've reversed the table here. I said, you know, you have to ultimately get frustrated with the idea of increasing energy on mass. You, you have to just, it's like banging your head against the wall and trying to cram it through the wall. You will never be able to do it this way. So the new way, as I propose, is to make this all possible. And when you consider UFOs coming in, stopping on a dime, and then accelerating and turning out into space, any Air Force pilot can tell you that stopping on a dime, the G-forces are going to throw you right through the walls. Yeah, you'll be crushed. And then sudden acceleration mm -hmm. is going to do the same thing. It's going to destroy mm -hmm. the body of the pilot. So this, this new approach and this new idea, I mean, it, this is just the inception, it's just the beginning, but um, I think this is really the only w avenue that we can look down right now and the only way we can see uh, solving this problem. While Gordon Cooper was an Air Force pilot stationed in Munich, Germany in 1951, in the 86 fighter bomber group where he flew F-84s and F-86s, Cooper testifies to having chased disc-shaped UFOs that outmaneuvered the most advanced fighter jets of our time. We were flying in Germany and we were flying F-86s and they would come over and do the same maneuvers that we make except every once in a while one of them would go zip and you just can't do that in a fighter conventional fighter. They're just typical uh, saucer shape, double lenticular shape, metallic looking. Well yeah, they weren't just random, they were flying, uh, they were flying fighter formations, very definitely under positive control. I'm here to announce that the second annual Exopolitics Expo, X Conference 2005, was concluded on Sunday, April 24th. This event was produced by Paradigm Research Group. 26 speakers and panelists presented to 450 attendees over three days. 
It was a unique event which focuses on the political, governmental, and social implications 